Welcome to the video for chapter 29 of the Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, which is going to tell you about R and N stems and about the periphrastic future. First of all, R stems, or strictly speaking, vocalic R stems. As far as their endings are concerned, these are completely straightforward for us because, with one exception, we already know all the endings that R stems use. Then, like NT stems, which we were introduced to in chapter 25, they have stem gradation, meaning they have a weak stem and a strong stem. The weak stem ends just in vocalic R. The strong stem, which is used in the strong cases, i.e. nominative, vocative, accusative, singular and dual, and nominative and vocative plural, has either guna R or vritti R, and we will see soon when we get guna and when we get vritti. Then finally, concerning their internal sandhi, that is quite straightforward. Whenever we have um, stem final vocalic R, this remains as vocalic R before an ending that begins with a consonant, but turns into consonantal or regular R whenever we have an ending that begins with a vowel. Before we go on to looking at a full R stem paradigm, let's briefly take a look at the semantics, that is the meaning of R stems. Most R stems actually end not just in er, but in ter, and fall into two semantic groups. The first of these groups, by far the smaller, is kinship terms, that is words expressing family relationships, such as mater, meaning mother, pitter, father, duiter, daughter and brater, brother. And yes, the reason why these words in Sanskrit and in English sound so similar to each other is because they are related. As far as their forms are concerned, these have their strong stem in guna. So we get matar, pittar, duhitar and bratar, and their weak stems in zero grade. So matar, pittar, duhitar and brater. The same applies to one other word, namely nur, meaning man, which has its strong stem also in guna, nar, and its weak stem in zero grade, nur. By far the bigger group of R stems are so-called agent nouns, that is, nouns that talk about someone who does something, such as teacher, baker, leader, and so on. These are formed by taking a verbal root in guna and adding the suffix ter. So, for example, on the basis of ni to lead, we get ni ter, meaning leader. On the basis of lab to take, we get lab ter, someone who takes, a taker. The internal sandhi in that is explained in chapter 8, in case you're not quite sure what's happening there. Or from raksh to protect, we get rakshi ter, protector. Note that we here have an e appearing between the uh, between the verbal root, raksh, and the ter. This is the same kind of e that we've also seen appear before other words that used a suffix beginning with t. So tum, the infinitive, ta, the ta participle, twa, the gerund, and so on. These forms have their strong stem in vritti, so end in tar, and their weak stem in zero grade, ending in ter. So let's look at two R stem paradigms, specifically one from each group, namely Pitru, father, a uh, kinship term, and nature leader, which would be an agent noun. The gray, the shaded fields in this table contain the strong cases, i.e. the forms that are based on the strong stem. Remember that it's only in the strong cases that we have different stems, namely for kinship terms guna and for, um, for agent nouns vritti. In the weak cases, we have the same stem for both, namely the stem in zero grade. Let's begin by looking at the strong cases. In the singular, we have pitta, pitach, pitaram. As we've seen in a number of paradigms before, the nominative and vocative are a little unexpected in their form and best can be or best should be memorized. Pitaram, on the other hand, is predictable. What we here have is the stem in guna, pitar, and then the ending am that we've already seen in a number of other um, paradigms. Then in the dual, we have pitarau, and in the plural, we have pitarach. 
So in both cases, we have the strong stem pitar plus endings that we already know from many other paradigms, namely au and ach. Then in the case of nature, lida, we have the singular neta, netach, netaram. Again, nominative and vocative should simply be memorized. Netaram then again is predictable, namely we have the strong stem in vrti, netar, plus our ending am that we already know from a number of other paradigms. Then in the dual netarau and in the plural netarach, i.e. we have the strong stem which stands in vrti, netar, plus the endings au and ach that we already know from other paradigms. Then the locative singular, as you can see, also is shaded because unexpectedly here the stem again stands in again stands in, in, in guna, pitari and netari. Note it's in guna for both types. So not pitari and netari, but pitari and netari. So guna in the stem in the locative singular. Then let's look at the weak forms. In the singular, we have the weak stem pitru, so in zero grade, plus the endings a and e that we already know from other consonant stems, basically. And then in the ablative and genitive, we have the one ending that was mentioned earlier that is different from what we've seen before. It's uch, so we get pituch. Then completely parallel in neter, we get netra, netre with endings we already know, and netuch with an ending we don't know and that we just need to straightforwardly memorize. Then the dual is, again, straightforward. We have Peter Bjam and Peter Och, with the A at the end of the stem remaining vocalic in front of Bjam, but changing into a consonantal A in front of Och. So it's Peter Bjam and Peter Och. Same thing in nature, Neter Bjam, Neter Och. Then in the plural, we have some forms that behave just like consonant stems, and those would be the instrumental, dative, ablative, and locative. There we have the stem pitter or nature plus bich, biach, biach, and su, which through the rookie rule, so through internal sandhi, changes into shu. But the accusative and genitive plural behave like vowel stems. What we've got here is piturn and neturn and piturnam and neturnam, respectively. What's happening here is that these forms are basically parallel to other short vowel stems that we've seen. So short A stems, short I stems, short U stems form their accusative plural by lengthening the stem final vowel and adding N. So we have Naran, Agnin, Danun. And we have in the genitive plural the stem final vowel lengthened and nam added. So we have, for example, nara, nam, hari, nam, and so on. And so here we have pitur, nam, and netur, nam. So in the plural, all endings that we already know, just in a combination that we might not expect, in accusative and genitive, vowel stem endings, and in instrumental, dative, ablative, and locative consonant stem endings, i.e. just the stem, plus the consonant stem endings bich, biach, biach, and su, which through internal sandhi becomes shu. Next up, n stems. There are two formal varieties of n stems, namely an stems and in stems, ending in an and in respectively. All n stems are either masculine or neuter, the feminine of them is formed in a slightly different way, and we'll come to look at that in just a minute. The neuter end stems differ from their masculine counterparts in the nominative, vocative, and accusative of all numbers, but in the instrumental and all the other following cases, dative, ablative, and so on, they are formally identical to the masculine. All of these use consonant stem endings, which we were introduced to in chapter 15, so that shouldn't be any challenge for us. There are no new endings that we need to memorize. Unstems and instems use the same endings, but because they differ from each other in how their stems behave and in their internal sandhi, we still need to look at them separately. First of all, unstems, these have stem gradation. And the distribution of strong and weak cases is exactly as we know it from other noun stems. 
so the strong stem is found in the masculine nominative vocative accusative singular and dual and in the nominative and vocative plural it ends in with the an and so for example from atman meaning self we get the accusative singular atmanam with the strong stem ending in vritti atman and the ending am that we already know for the accusative singular from another from a number of other consonant stems the weak stem then ends in zero grade n but in words where the an is preceded by two consonants and specifically in cases whose endings begin with a vowel the weak stem does not have zero grade n but actually an so for example of naman meaning name we get the instrumental singular nam na with the stem in zero grade namun plus a but in the case of atman meaning self where the an is preceded by tm by two consonants we get the instrumental singular atmanna with the stem ending in an and not in n just like in a stems the locative singular of n stems of an stems can be in guna or in zero grade so for example of naman we can get the locative namanni or namni we do get a little bit of internal sandhi in unstems, specifically in cases where we have the weak stem ending in just n rather than an. Wherever the n stands between consonants, it changes into a. If you don't quite remember how that works anymore, go back to chapter 7 and the section on nasals between consonants. Where the n does remain as a consonant, it can assimilate to whatever stop precedes it. So, for example, of Rajan, meaning king, we get the instrumental singular Rajnya. So the dental N turns into a palatal N after the palatal stop J, Rajnya. Whereas in the instrumental plural, the N changes into an A, giving us not Rajn Bih, but Raja Bih. Let's look at two examples of unstems. One where the an is preceded by just one consonant, another where it's preceded by two consonants. Remember, that is going to affect what their weak stem looks like. The uh, first of these is Rajan, meaning king. The second is Atman, meaning self or soul. Again, the shaded fields in this table contain the strong cases. But unlike in R stems, it's in the strong cases that the two types of unstem are formally identical. It's only in the weak cases that we have formal differences. So let's begin by looking at the strong cases where we have Raja, Rajan, Rajanam, and Atma, Atman, and Atmanam. As with many other stems before, the nominative and vocative singular are perhaps a little unexpected in their form, Raja, Rajan, and Atma, Atman. So the best approach, as before, is to just straightforwardly memorize them. In the accusative singular, then, we have the expected vritti stem, rajan and atman, followed by the consonant stem ending am for the accusative singular, so rajanam and atmanam. Then in the dual, we have the expected strong stem ending in vritti an, rajan and atman, plus the ending au. And then in the nominative and vocative plural, we have again the expected strong stem in vritti, rajan, atman, plus the ending ach. Let's go on to the weak cases, first of all, of Rajan. What we have here is the zero grade Rajan and the endings that we already know from other consonant stems, namely Rajnya, Rajni, Rajnyach and Rajni, with the locative also having the alternative form Rajani. Now, in front of these um, uh, vocalic endings and after a consonant that is palatal, the dental N changes into a palatal N. So we don't have Rajna, but Rajnya, Rajnye, Rajnyach, Rajni. Notice that um, the N, of course, does not change when there is an A between it and the J. Then Atman is very straightforward in the singular because we have the weak stem Atman plus the consonant stem endings A, E, Ach, Ach, I. So Atmana, Atmane, Atmanach, Atmanach, Atmani. 
Then in the dual, we have Rajabhyam and Rajnyoh. What's happening here is that the weak stem, Rajnya, in front of an ending that begins with a consonant, appears not as Rajnya, but as Raja. So we get Rajabhyam instead of Rajnbhyam. In front of the Och, however, that is the genitive and locative dual ending and which begins with a vowel, we find exactly the same happening as in the singular, namely the N after the palatal J changes into palatal Ny, and so we get Rajnyoch. Then in the case of Atman, we get Atma Bhyam, the weak stem, which would be Atman, does not appear as Atman in front of the ending that begins with a consonant, but as Atma, Atma Bhyam. And then in front of an ending that begins with a vowel, we once again get the alternative weak stem with an instead of n, and so we get at man noch. Then in the plural, we again have the n in the weak stem of rajn stand, uh, changing into ny in front of endings that begin with a vowel, and the n changing into a in front of endings that begin with a consonant. So we get Rajnyach, Rajnyach, Rajabich, Rajabyach, Rajabyach, genitive plural Rajnyam, and Rajasu. So whenever the ending begins with a consonant, the stem appears as Raja. Whenever the ending begins with a vowel, the stem appears as Rajnya. Then in the case of Atman, we again have the weak stem appearing as Atman, in front of endings that begin with vowels, but in front of endings that begin with consonants, we have the same kind of stem as with Rajan, namely the n at the end of the stem changes into a. Nasal, nasals do that between consonants. And so we have at man ach, at ma bich, at ma piach, at man nam, and at ma su. In both cases, the locative plural su remains as su because it is preceded by the vowel a, and that does not trigger, uh, trigger the rookie rule. As was mentioned earlier, neuter unstems have forms that are different from their masculine counterparts only in nominative, vocative, and accusative. All other cases have the same endings. And as we've already seen in various other neuter paradigms, nominative, vocative, and accusative share one and the same ending. So of naman, meaning name, we have the singular nominative, vocative, accusative form nama. So basically the stem final N has just been dropped. Then we have the dual namani or namni. So the root, sorry, the stem either is in guna or in zero grade. But in either case, you can recognize the form through the ending that is long e, which we've already had in other neuter consonant stems. So, for example, of jagat, meaning world, we had jagati, two worlds. Of manas, meaning mind, we had manasi, two minds. And then finally, the plural form is namani, which may seem a little odd because here we basically have vritti of the stem. But what in effect we have is the ending ani, which parallels, for example, neuter plurals of short a stems. So from wana, we get wanani. And then in other neuter nominative, vocative, accusative plurals, we also have long vowel plus ne. So for example, from wari, water, we had warini. From madu, we had maduni, and so on. So namani, a very recognizable, loc not locative, sorry, nominative, vocative, and accusative plural neuter ending. Finally, then, in stems, these are formally much simpler, much more straightforward than unstems, you will be delighted to hear. But before we go on to looking at their forms, let's briefly look at their meaning. In can be added to both noun stems and to verbal roots. And when it is added to a noun stem, it creates adjectives that mean having that noun. So, for example, on the basis of bala, which means strength, we get balin, which means having strength, i.e. strong. On the basis of weda, knowledge, we get wedin, which means having knowledge and therefore knowing, knowledgeable or wise. On the basis of hasta, which means hand, we get hastin, which literally means having a hand. This adjective is most typically used as a noun 
meaning someone who has a noticeable hand, and as such is used to refer to elephants, which have a no very noticeable hand, namely their trunk, which they use to pick up things. Note, if you have in added to a short A stem, then the final short A of that short, short A stem is dropped out before the in, and so we don't have bala in, but balin, not weda in, but wedin, and so on. When in is added to a verbal root, which can stand either in guna or virti, we get an adjective that means doing that verb. So, for example, on the basis of kur, to do, we get either karin or karin, meaning doing or someone who does, a doer. On the basis of ji, to win or to conquer, we get jayin, meaning winning or victorious, and so on. There is one more type of in stem that ends specifically in win, and when you add win to a noun, it's basically like adding want or munt, i.e. you get an adjective that means having that noun. So, for example, on the basis of tejas, meaning splendor, we get tejas win, meaning having splendor and therefore splendid or bright, and on the basis of tapas, meaning heat, or specifically religious austerities that are unpleasant, just like heat, you get tapas win, which means having or practicing religious austerities, and therefore an ascetic. The internal sandhi of all in stems is that they appear uh, ending in in before endings that begin with vowels, but they end in e before endings that begin with consonants. The feminines of in stems add long e to the stem and thus decline like regular long i stems. So, for example, on the basis of balind, we get balini, which would be a female strong one, a strong woman. Let's look at a sample paradigm of an in stem. And what we've got here is the masculine and neuter of balin, meaning strong. Note, first of all, that the feminines of in stems actually aren't in stems, but add long i, so they decline uh, just like uh, long i stems, like nadi, for example, and therefore we don't need to include them here. Secondly, note that the masculine and neuter are formally different only in nominative, vocative, and accusative, and that from the instrumental on, they are completely parallel. So let's begin by looking at the masculines, where in the singular we have nominative and vocative bali and balin. As with several other stems, nominative and vocative singular are not easily predictable in their form, so the best way of approaching them is to straightforwardly memorize these two forms, bali and balin. Then from the accusative singular onwards, we have completely predictable forms. Namely, we have the stem balin in front of an ending that begins with a vowel, and the stem bali in front of an ending that begins with a consonant. And the endings that we find used are just the normal consonant stem endings. So in the singular, we have balin plus the endings am, a, e, ach, ach, i, balinam, balina, baline, balinach, balinach, balini. In the dual, we have balinau, balibiam, balinoch, again balin in front of endings that begin with a vowel, namely au and och, and the stem bali in front of endings that begin with a consonant, so balibiam. And that same pattern of balin and bali is upheld in the plural, where we have balinach, 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 balibich, balibiach, balibiach, balinam, balishu, and again the locative plural ending su changes into shu after the vowel i, which causes internal sandhi, um, specifically the rookie rule. Now, the neuter has in the singular nominative, vocative, accusative, the form bali, where basically the final n has just dropped. Compare that to what we saw in unstems, where we had nama. In instems, however, we sometimes have an alternative vocative singular form, balin, so basically parallel to what we find in the masculine. Then in the dual, we have nominative vocative accusative balini, with the ending e that we already know from the dual of other neuter consonant stems. And in front of this e, the stem appears as balin, so balini. And finally, we get the plural form, which is balini, 
which maybe doesn't quite fit the system, but it's um, rather recognizable because it follows that pattern of neuter, nominative, vocative, accusative plurals ending in long vowel plus n plus e that we've seen, for example, in Mitrani, in Warini, in Madhuni, and so on. That was it as far as new forms are concerned. If you'd like some advice on how to best familiarize yourself with this wealth of new information, these various different stems, perhaps go to the nutshell at the end of chapter 29 in the book. That will give you some hints. But before you do that, let's look at just one more usage of one of the forms introduced in this chapter, and that is the periphrastic future, which uses R stems. Now, periphrastic is a technical term that's here basically used to mean one concept or one idea that is expressed by more than one word. So far, we've had just the regular future. So, for example, from Bharati, he carries, we get a future Bharishyati, he will carry. And there we have the idea of he will carry expressed by just one word, Bharishyati. The periphrastic future, on the other hand, uses more than one word, or specifically uses two words, namely an agent noun in tr, and a form of as, the, ver the verb meaning to be. So, for example, ne ta asmi, in addition to meaning I am a leader, can also be used to mean I will lead. So we have two forms, ne ta asmi, that together express the idea of a first singular future. Now let's look at these forms in a little more detail. In the first and second persons, what we have is the nominative singular form of an agent noun, which then ends in ta, so for example ne ta, combined with the relevant form of as to be. So for example of ne ta, we have ne ta asmi, ne ta swach, ne ta smach. Ne in the second persons, we have ne ta asi, ne ta stach, and ne ta sta. And these can either be written as two words or can be combined into one word. So ne ta asmi, ne ta swach, ne ta smach, and so on. And in the third persons, we have just the agent noun in the nominative of the respective number. So in the singular, we have ne ta. In the dual, we have ne ta rau. And in the plural, we have ne ta rach. And these, when used as the periphrastic future, would mean he will lead they both will lead and they, plural, will lead respectively. When you encounter an instance of the periphrastic future, you should translate it into English just like a regular future. So I will see, I will lead and so on. It will be the syntax, i.e. the context of the sentence that will help you recognize a periphrastic future as a periphrastic future rather than as a normal use of an agent noun. Um, one example of that would be from the Mahabharata, Asmi Hanta Jayadratam. Asmi Hanta could mean I am a killer or it could mean I will kill. Together with Jayadratam in the accusative, it can only mean I will kill because if it meant I am a killer, then there's no way that we could make use of that accusative. But if we recognize Asmihanta as a periphrastic future, then we can see that Jayadratam simply is the direct object and that Asmihanta Jayadratam means I will kill Jayadrata. That was it for this chapter. We hope that you found this video helpful, and if you have any comments or suggestions, we would love to hear from you. Please do write to us at ruppel at cambridge-sanskrit.org. And now, for your own work on this material, good luck and have fun.